Good evening, Musar class. So as you know, we've started a new book. We are on The Three Conditions by Moshe Gerst. And tonight we're going to try our very best to finish up chapter one. <laughs> it's taken a lot. These are some really big concepts. And I really wanted to make sure that I'm trying to present the bulk of what he's saying, but please go back and read the whole chapter for yourself because there's a lot of parts that I'm not completely capturing that I'd really like you to understand and, and add to what your, the overall picture of what your understanding is. So let me go ahead and I do this every time I need to push the right button, share my screen. Um, okay. And I don't know what's going on on my screen right now. I need this. There we go. Miss Hadass, can you see everything on my screen? Okay, good. All right. And then we're going to put the slideshow on. All right. So if you guys remember last time we were talking about, let me move our pictures. Oh, there's no good place. Okay. We were talking about, um, our beliefs and how we have to, you know, go from our emotion to our thought, to our belief. This is our map. And we're using that to be able to change our thinking because we have to change our beliefs to change how we're thinking, which will then change our feelings. And so we're going to start with stage one, the loss of inner harmony. This was so, so super cool. Um, he says, what is the loss of inner harmony? He says the very first story in Torah acts as a perfect metaphor for this idea. The Talmud elucidates the story in Genesis about Adam and Eve in the following manner. A man and woman were created as a single entity, back to back. Then God split one from the other and charged them with the mission to reunite with one another. The beginning of is unity and the end is unity. It is only in the time between that things are experienced separately. And most people have this misconception that this story is strictly speaking about a man and a woman, while in reality, this story portrays, uh, or sorry, plays out within every single one of us. You see, we all have the qualities of being creators and achievers, as well as experiencers of love, peace, freedom, and joy. So when the author goes through this part of the chapter, he talks about how Hava's name, or you know, it's the Hebrew name for Eve. Hava's name um, comes from the same word that means experience, and and Adam's name comes from the same word that means I will become like. And so, literally, Adam and Eve is the same as you know, experiencing and becoming like. And when we talk about the um, Kabbalistic side of things, um, women are often put under the, the Bina, which is understanding, and men are often put under the Chokmah, which is wisdom. So you have this understanding, which is the experience and wisdom, which is coming from the, I will become like, and the thing about this is, is these are both in each one of us. Yes, men tend to be more left-brained and women tend to be more right-brained, but everybody has all of these abilities. And it's just a matter of what you're going to, how you're going to balance this out. Because you need to have understanding and you need to have wisdom, but they have to be in balance with one another. Um, and the whole point that he's making here is that it's not just about you know, you finding your true love and reuniting, but it's about you reuniting your understanding with your wisdom, putting those two parts of you 
back together. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about this left brain, right brain thing. Um, just in case you haven't in, you know, thought about in a minute, left brain people tend to be analytical thinking. They're into numbers, language, reasoning, logic, science, and math. And right brain people tend to be emotionally intelligent, have a big imagination, expressive, expressive art awareness, uh, intuition, and creativity. Like I said before, we all have all of these uh, things. Both, you know, we all have two sides of the brain. We, Some of us favor the right more than the left, and some favor the left more than the right. But it, it goes back to that whole whole idea that there are um, all of these qualities together within us and we need to unify them, okay? So <clears throat> let's talk about the natural divide. We're um, left with this message. We are all born with the power to achieve greatness and be creators in our life. Yet we all have the innate desire to live with joy, love, and peace and experience wholeness and fulfillment regardless of what we accomplish. However, we have been split into the separation of the soul and body, the mind and heart, a mental divide between the way we judge and analyze life and how we live and experience it. So think about that for a minute, because he's he's putting into a dichotomy all these things that are split. So just like we saw in the previous picture, you know, the the um the sephirot is in each one of us, right? And it has this masculine and feminine sides. Well, same way with our left brain, right brain, right? And our body and our soul and, you know, all on and on. The thing is, is that trying to put all these things back together is the challenge. The imbalance between these two opposites is the source of disharmony. So by putting so much focus and attention, okay, so this is where he talks about when we're trying to put these things back together, if you're super focused and you're attention is constantly on climbing the ladder of success, you know, um, making a good profit or having a lot of, of things, um, keeping up with the Joneses, all that kind of stuff. Um, then your focus is on what's in the world, not on the, not on the spiritual part of trying to put these two things back together. And he's like, he's saying that's not that we shouldn't be focused on the life that we live every day. Yes, we need to. It just shouldn't be the only thing. It We really need to repair that disharmony within ourselves. Because, you know, I mean, gosh, I can remember ever since I was very young, when people talked about how, oh, yeah, she's just looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, what is the right place? You know, there is no perfect person. There is no perfect scenario in your life where you're not going to encounter disharmony because the disharmony is coming from within the disharmony is coming because of the separations that we just talked about but we can repair that disharmony and do a whole lot more and that's the idea behind this book um <clears throat> i like this picture because it's two minds, right? You've got this face here and then you've got this bigger face out on the edge. And um, the whole thing about this is, is tikkun olam, which means repairing the world. Essentially, the, the progression is the basic nature of your entire experience, right? Before life, you are one with the source and the infinite potential of life, then you are seemingly split off as an individual, you're individualized and created as a separate entity in your perceived separateness. You forget the true nature of your being an eternal, never ending light of love and potential. When you don't feel this truth, 
you feel small, weak, alone, and vulnerable. A subliminal existential fear becomes an underpinning driving force in your life and you adopt by trusting the big people you are surrounded by as a child, it seemingly might have been better not to go through this splitting process. But in contrast to the initial unity, you now have an opportunity to reunite with the source energy from a place of conscious choice and independence. That, my friends, is beautiful. So when you were your baby, you were, you know, before you were born, you were part of Hashem. You were all one with him. But you allowed him to split you off and make you into an individual and send you out just so that you could choose to come back. And coming back is within you. This is huge. Okay, so the story of Adam and Eve represents a cosmic divorce that we've undergone between these two dimensions of our once whole inner self. Our main objective in life is to find our other half, our true soulmate, the innate joy, love, and trusting spirit, and marry the two halves of our being into one. We can create a united outer world only if we learn to live with unity from within. So I don't know about you, but a lot of people, you know, will talk about from time to time to kun olam, which means repairing the world. And we're supposed to, you know, be working to repair all the things we see. And some people get really excited about like, um, you know, taking care of, of, you know, animals or, or nature and all that stuff. And they, they view that as their part of tukun alam, you know, or clean up all the, the pollution and, you know, take care of the garden that we live in as this planet. Right. But the thing about that is, is all that kind of work is for naught if you're not working on it inside of you. And I, you know, one of my favorite stories is one that the Chovas Chaim told about how he tried so hard to change, you know, the world and it wasn't working. So he tried changing, you know, his country and that didn't work and tried changing, you know, his city didn't work, tried changing his synagogue didn't work, tried changing his family that didn't work, tried changing himself and that worked. And then he kept working on himself. And next thing he noticed is his family changed. He kept working on himself and his synagogue changed. He kept working on himself. His city started to change. He kept working on himself. His country changed. He kept working on himself and the world started to change. That is the key. The key to, to Kun Olam, repairing the world, is the work that we do within ourselves to repair these two parts that were split apart. All right, so I'm sorry, I have to keep moving this. Um, stage two, your thoughts create your moments. Although the human mind is universally accepted as our greatest tool in shaping our experience of life, it can just as easily be our arch nemesis. It can be a loving friend as easily as it can be a wicked enemy. On one hand, we credit the human mind with developing, creating, and manifesting our great achievements. Um, on this exact point, Napoleon Hill said, more gold has been mined from the thoughts of men than has been taken from the earth. On the other hand, much of the world's chaos is a result of the nightmare this tool has created. So our minds are powerful. We can use it for great good and we can use it for great evil. And I had an awesome picture for there and I forgot to put it in. So I'm very sorry. Um, who, okay. And this one got forgotten. So when you change the way you think, you change the way you live. And I have a feeling I had this as an extra. So let's start talking about the uh, living your miracle mindset. 
again, please read the book because there's lots of parts that I'm not, I'm not quite getting to. Okay, so we have this lovely picture of a beautiful tree with all of our labels on the branches. The first branch is B for behavior. So this is an acronym, branch. And behavior is B, and it says, um, <clears throat> when you feel good, you behave differently. You are more productive. You act with clarity and precision. You are nicer, friendlier, and more positive in situations and outcomes. Your actions and reactions to life situations flow seamlessly, and you make better choices. You're also more flexible and confident. Why are all the results of the miracle? Are why are all these results of the miracle mindset? Because we make choices based on how we feel. We can always justify and rationalize our de our decisions, and as a general rule, we do what we want. The heart is king. Feeling good is the most important decision you can make. Feel good first. The miracle mindset is a bridge back to the natural feeling of love, joy, and peace. That's huge. Okay, so let's talk about branch number two, relationships. People can instantly feel your energy when, you, when it's um, uplifted. It can immediately strengthen communication and connection. It isn't just because your behavior is nicer. It's actually the energetic effect of being near someone who is in a truly positive space. When you are deeply connected to consciousness, to God, you are present. You elevate the entire room without saying a word. People may not even realize that, that it's happening or why, but they are drawn to you. They desire a relationship with you and you are more likely to be influenced or, and they are more likely to be influenced by you. When you align with your natural sense of inner joy, your influence expands and your energy becomes magnetic. This alignment shifts the energy of your home, sharpens your ability to make new relationships and business deals. And brings peace to those who are struggling. Your presence instills calm. Leaves others feeling energized. Allows people to feel better about themselves. And part of something bigger. Inspires a sense of purpose. And builds people's trust in authentic personal connections. You know that right there sounds like what so many people want. So many people want that. I mean, how many people do you know, talk about being lonely, talk about not feeling connected, talk about no community. I mean, right here, number two, this miracle mindset does all these things that people are desperately seeking for, looking for love in all the wrong places. So let's talk about these more branches. Okay. So number three, attraction and abundance. <clears throat> the Zohar, an ancient Kabbalistic text, explicitly states that the world shifts for us and leans in our favor when we are happy and positive. Wow, that's huge. Our mental state and emotional reality define our vibrational frequency and thus what we draw into our lives. That includes the people, experiences, and things that correspond to how we feel. Abundance follows abundant thoughts and feelings. Love follows love. Joy follows joy. That is why we experience tremendous synchronicity when we're in the right mental space. The powerful Wayne Dreyer statement, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. That is a huge statement. And it makes me think about um, the experiment they did with light particles where they, you know, 
shot the light particles on a board and they went in one way they changed um like like they shot them out this way and you know there was nothing in the way and they kind of i thought they went like in a ripple effect and then they put something here with slits in it and they went straight through the slits but then they found out that if um they I think when they had it, they, what they did is put a camera on the particles and they were able to figure out that the particles would change how they went through the, the slits and, you know, they changed into a, a different, I think it was a wave part pattern again. Um, once they realized they were being observed, I mean, come on, this is huge. Our, our whole, um, Oh gosh, he says, the way you look at it, you know, things change when the way you look at it, it changes. So something that you consider not so good, if you change your perspective, you might actually find that it really is good. And that again goes back to, you know, months and months ago when Emmett talked about um, how when you, when you look at every day as a blessing and how are you going to open up that day? And some of the things that happen in your day that don't seem like they're so great, if you unwrap it carefully, you might actually find that those not so great things really and truly are a blessing. They might be teaching you something. They might be giving you something. It might be the reason someone else gives you something. You don't know. And so that's why we wake up every morning saying the Modayani, because we want to thank God for giving us another day and another chance to do, do amazing things and to do this tikkun within our own selves and for the whole world, right? Okay, so back to our, our guy here. He says, um, <clears throat> it isn't just a nice wordplay. In reality, um, it is reality. In Think and Grow, Think and Grow Rich, Napoleon Hill states, our brain becomes magnetized with the uh, dominating thoughts which we hold in our minds. And by means with which no man is familiar, these magnets attract to us forces, people, and circumstances of life, which harmonizes with the nature of our uh, dominating thoughts. This is why a miracle mindset attracts all forms of abundance and miraculous life. Um, he talks about in the chapter. So again, please read the chapter because there's so much in there. He talks about how, you know, if you're, if you're super focused on being successful, then you'll get success. But if you're super focused on being wealthy, you'll get wealth. But if you're really focused on the miracles and getting the miracles, you get all of it. And then the thing is, and that I really want to send him a message because I would love to find out the answer to my question here. But he talks about um, the next one is the person who's focused on godliness gets godliness. Okay, well, he put these in a specific order. I want to understand is, is that mean that godliness is like a companionship, a deeper companionship with Hashem, whereas, whereas the miracle mindset is more of like, I don't know. I'm, it's like right there. I'm, mm, it's a big idea. I can't wait. I'm going to have to ask. Anyways, <laughs> um, number four is um, negation. So when you're in a powerful state of positivity and light, you don't just bring good energy into the room. You actually negate and soften negative energy. Lower energy vibrations and frequencies can't stand in the face of higher ones. The Balsam Tove poetically explains that this is the meaning of the verse, mountains will melt like wax before God. The mountains of negative thoughts and energies cannot stand in the light of godliness and higher consciousness. You become an island of peace in what others would consider a chaotic sea. This, it is almost as if you are walking within an invisible bubble 
that repels negative forces. Misery likes company, and that means it won't like being around you. When we have the miracle mindset of light and love, nothing negative and destructive in the world can get in our way. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so huge. Mountains will melt. That sounds familiar. Um, you will move mountains from one place to another. I mean, I mean, it's huge. Um, the fact that it's like you're walking around with an invisible bubble around you. But, you know, he makes a good point too. Misery likes company. And when you're working on improving your walk, your closeness with Hashem, you're, you're, you're working on that equanimity, which this, what this is all about is equanimity. When you're getting that balance and you're able to change your thinking and your feelings and you're becoming more positive, you might find it can be a little lonely sometimes <laughs> because other people who want to sit around and grouse about things or complain or, you know, they're not going to want to be around you. <laughs> Which is good because, you know, good company attracts, you know, good, you know, good character attracts good company. So, you know, good things there, but just be aware. <laughs> you're not going to be the person who people might want to chat with at the coffee cooler because you're so positive and they're not feeling super positive at the moment. All right. So more branches. Number five, channeling and creativity. When you feel good in your high energy state, you become a channel for divine insight. You can receive new information and creative ideas more easily and become a clear conduit for miracles and spiritual guidance. The world will literally bend for you and your intentions as you receive obvious divine messages. In this state, your intuition is heightened and your ability to contribute to the world is multiplied that sounds amazing oh my gosh that sounds amazing i would like to get to that part number six healing aside from happiness having been clinically proven to enhance healing processes all spiritual paths universally recognize that being happy and in a peak energetic state has a potent healing properties through the power of the miracle mindset and the joyous energy. It engenders people all around the world throughout all of history have experienced cures and healing from the life threatening diseases, anxiety, depression, and even ailments as simple as headaches, pulled muscles, and the common cold. The way you feel changes the way your body heals. Healing doesn't refer to just the recovery of the physical body. Those ailments are often physical manifestations of something happening within you. True healing occurs when one spirit releases a long-held fear or a negative thinking pattern towards oneself, others, or life. This healing is activated by living in a spiritual alignment with the miracle mindset. I don't know you guys, but I'm pretty excited about this miracle mindset. All right, so you are a creator. You have the ability to live the life you want to live, build the relationships of your dreams, attract incredible abundance, negate all negative energy, channel insight, wisdom, and guidance, and heal yourself and the world all around you. This is the promise of shifting your level of consciousness. That's huge. This is the power of recognizing the joy of your life. This is the outcome of marrying your inner soulmate and unifying the truth of your self. What is the only thing that is really in your control? Your conscious thinking. Your whole life depends on how you think. 
You are the creator of your life. Imagination is the clothing of the spirit. So what do you want to wear today? I would try on the miracle mindset and see how it fits. I should have put a picture of somebody in a fancy dress. <laughs> this is the thing. If you, if you wake up on the wrong side of the bed every day and go into work negative and complaining and grouching and complaining, you know, that's what you're going to get. If you wake up in your bed grateful and start your day on a positive note, your day is going to be more positive. And the way we do that is we start out the day praying. We start out the day thanking God and blessing him and listening to Torah and all those things, right? Because we want that closeness with Hashem. And I'm convinced more than ever that the way you get that super duper close relationship and all the looking for love in the wrong places disappears is when you are able to unite these two parts of yourself. All right, stage three, what you believe is what you see. Uh, we would all love to be, <clears throat> we would all love for it to be this easy. Think a happy thought and feel a happy feeling and now be the greater version of you. Unfortunately, we know that it's not that simple. Positive thinking is extremely important, but there are some prerequisites to energizing the power of your mind. First and foremost, it's important to know that we are dealing with two minds, the conscious and subconscious. Your conscious mind produces what you think about at any given moment. The subconscious mind is what sets the stage for how we experience reality. It dictates how we feel, which is why some have called it the feeling mind. Okay, so we're going to do another acronym. We just did branches and now we're going to do art. So art stands for automatic uh, response thinking. Okay, so we got to be creators by changing our automatic response thinking. We are made in the image of our creator, which means we ourselves are artists. The most important work we create in our, in our art is our automatic response thinking. Through agreeing with and believing in certain truths, we create a painting of how we see reality, which is the way our brain automatically responds to life circumstances. These paintings were created by us as children. As adults, we can now paint a new picture by reprogramming our beliefs. One of the ways that we do, the, do so is to shift our conscious thinking. Simply changing the thoughts in our head would be a good start. But what really runs our system of thinking is our paradigm of how the world operates and how we see ourselves and our, and our function in the world. So we think the way we think because we believe what we believe. Knowing this is the beginning of awakening and transforming our lives. All right, so let's rewrite the programming. As adults, we can now paint a new picture by reprogramming our beliefs. One of the ways that we do so is to shift our conscious thinking. Simply changing the thoughts in our head would be a good start, but what really runs our system is thinking, a system of thinking is our paradigm of how the world operates and how we see ourselves and our function in the world. So we think the way we think because we believe what we believe, knowing this is the beginning of, a, of awakening and transforming our lives. So we have to shift our beliefs of how this world is working. And one of the biggest ways that I've ever seen this is, especially in this modern day and age, is when we have, you know, something happens and all the conspiracy theorists come out and they are controlling us and they are doing this and whoever this they is, we don't know. 
But one of the things that I love about our prayers is we talk in, in our prayers, we talk, you know, uh, in the um, Amidah prayer, the standing prayer, we talk about how God is, he's the king and kingship is his. I think actually that's not in the Amidah, that's in the one that we do on Shabbos at the end of service. Um, and that we have no, our faith is not in anybody else, not in any man, not in an angel, not in anything else, just in God, because kingship belongs to God. So whichever president or king or chieftain or ruler is in, in office right now is there because God allowed it. He decided. He heard what we wanted, but he decided. And he has reasons. And we don't always know all his reasons. But if we can learn to rewrite our thinking from the they are controlling us to the God is in control, then that shifts everything. You might think, oh, yeah, well, what, how can I change God's mind? Well, there's this little thing called prayer. <laughs> and the more we pray and the more that we tell God our heart, the more he tells us his heart. Because, you know, he He cares so much, cares so deeply. He doesn't even let the birds starve. He feeds every single creature he, he created. From plants to animals to people, he feeds every single creature. He clothes them all and he houses them all. You might not like the house you got, but he gave it to you. <laughs> One way or another, he's made sure you have shelter. He's put you in families. He's put you where you need to be, where you will grow the most. He takes care of you so much that you are completely unaware of it. And when you start opening your eyes, how much God does for you, how much he takes care of you, how much he moves the whole world around just for you then you're going to stop worrying about the they's out there they're doing this and they control that or whatever and you're going to start going to the one who's in charge of everything and that's Hashem Albert Einstein said that you cannot generate a solution from the same mind that created the problem he was so incredibly right. You can't find a solution to a problem when you still see it as a problem. Only when you change your attitude, your inner experience of what is going on, will you become a clear channel for the new insights and ideas to enter your mind. If you really think about it, this is so true. You know, um, there's that, I think we've used it before too, the cute little picture of you got one guy standing over here and one guy standing over here. And from this guy's perspective, there's a six on the ground. And from this guy's perspective, there's a nine on the ground. It's like, if you just change where your perspective is, what, how you're looking at this, you're going to end up being able to see, oh, what I was calling a problem isn't a problem. And if you were in our class last time, you already learned that problems are what we're calling things when we have an unmet expectation and we're disappointed by the outcome. You know, the outcomes don't belong to us. <laughs> they belong to God. So instead of having a, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have this problem situation, take it to the guy who's in charge of everything. Okay, I love this part. <laughs> This has been in my mind for a minute. And I was like, yay, I was able to make it happen. Okay, so he tells this little story about a woman uh, who went to a conference and was asked to write on one card and in five chapters, the story of her life. <laughs> and so the first one, story number one, or chapter number one, let me say it the way, because I don't know that the pictures came out saying it exactly correctly but um get the exact words here chapter one i was walking on the street and i didn't notice a hole in the ground and i fell in i said to myself i don't know how this happened it's not my fault and i sat there a long time not knowing how to get out <laughs> so this is number one He's like, how did, this, how did this happen? Okay, number two. I was walking on the street 
and I noticed the hole in the ground and I fell in and I said to myself I don't know how this happened it's not my fault and I sat there a long time not knowing how to get out number three I was walking on the street I noticed a hole in the ground and I fell in but this time I said to myself I know how this happened and it is my fault and I was able to get out quickly. Chapter four, this guy here. I was walking on the street and I noticed the hole on the ground and I was able to avoid it altogether. Chapter five, I walked down a different street. <laughs> I love that. To me, um, this reminds me of how my mom taught me as a young kid about making changes in yourself. And she said, you want to make something change in yourself and you thinking about it, you're trying really hard and you make a mistake and you see it after you've made the mistake. You keep working on it, you keep trying really hard and then you start noticing it while it's in the process of happening. So you keep working on it, keep working on it, and eventually you catch it before it even happens and you don't make that same mistake again. This is what this story reminds me of. And I'm like, okay, yeah, let's not fall in the hole. Let's figure out how to spot it a mile away and know how to get out when we got to get out. But more than that, let's pick a different path. Let's tell a new story. So let's walk down that different road. Let's choose to walk down a different street and come to a new way of thinking, a new level of consciousness, a new way to live. It may require you to step out of your comfort zone and be open to the words and wisdom written on these pages. Remember that as you read and apply the ideas in this book, you will experience an inner shift of positive energy and the branches of having a miracle mindset. Choose your presence. Choose alignment. Choose the real you. All right, so the three conditions are what allows the mind's power to accelerate and create life, the life you want. They address your reality, your emotional state, and the inner agreements that you have uh, with yourself. By shifting the two most important beliefs you have, coming into alignment with truth behind those beliefs, and experiencing your natural state of joyous peace, you can become a super channel for love and miracles in your life. You can become a magnet for success and gain access to energy, healing, and power that you didn't even realize you had. Divine guidance and abundance will fill your life and all of the things that seemed insurmountable and in the way will seem to move to the side, opening the road to the uh, version of you that you want to experience. So that is the end of chapter one. <laughs> um, I know there is so much there. And again, please read the chapter because trying to prepare this for you guys is really hard not to literally write down everything he says because there's so much to what he says. And he has this way of putting like tons in one little statement. So it makes it like, you've really got to think about it and ponder it and challenge yourself with it. Um, but at the same time, I'm really super excited for us to keep moving through the book. So next week we'll be, um, on chapter two and we'll be on hopefully Wednesday next week <laughs> instead of Thursday. And I know I forgot to post last week's class. So I will be posting that here in just a little bit. Um, okay. Um, so let me think if we've got all the things. 
it, now that um, we're finished with all that, Miss Hadass, did you have any comments you wanted to make? If not, you can just shake your head no, and we'll we'll go ahead and move on. Okay, so, um, uh oh, look at that. We spent the whole hour. Oh my goodness. Um, so next week, Wednesday at eight o'clock. And don't forget to come to Shabbat service and Oneg. Oneg is the best part where we get to talk about lovely things like this book. Um, actually, last week in Oneg, somebody um, asked a question or had brought up something in Emmett's sermon, um, Drosh. And um, I said, hey, that sounds just like what we talked about in um, Musar class last week. And they were so surprised to see the synchronicity between what Emmett was talking about and what we had learned in Musar class. So Hashem is definitely in control all the way. We just have to keep our eyes open and learn to see things from his perspective too. Have a blessed week and love you guys so much. And don't forget we're at um, every Shabbat, 10 a.m. in Bedford, Texas. Come look us up. Have a good week.